Okay, good afternoon. We'd like to call the meeting back to order. And we'll begin with the election of delegate appointed committees. Audit committee is first. Yes, sir. Since this is the four mic, I would like to nominate Ruth Herring and John Haskell for the audit committee. Second. We have, we have a second. Second. All those in favor of the nominees for the uh, audit committee, raise your delta badge and say aye. 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 All opposed? It passes. <laughs> Next is bylaws committee. All right, for the bylaws committee, I nominate Guy Hoffman of Wisconsin, Richard Kepke of Northern California. Robert Messenger of Massachusetts, Gerald Larson of Alabama, James Manella of Southern California, Myron Lieberman of Arizona, Harold Winston of Illinois, Gary Kitts of Michigan, Gary Walters of Ohio, Steve Emmett of New York, John McCrary, South Carolina, Randy Huff, Southern California, David Mail of Maryland, and Srinivas Alampali, from upstate New York. You all those in favor? Raise your credentials. Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Election Committee. Mr. Pre Mr. President, the bylaws are explicit that the Election Committee shall have four members and may name one or more alternates. I therefore nominate Kenneth Ballou of Massachusetts Myron Lieberman of Arizona, Kenneth Sloan of Alabama, Andrew Thal of Ohio, and as alternate, Alex Relier of New Hampshire. All in favor, raise your credentials. All opposed, raise your credentials. Motion passes. For the, for the Ethics Committee, I nominate Harold Stenzel from New York, Hal Terry from New Hampshire, Ken Ballou from Massachusetts, David Hayter from Georgia, David Day from Utah, Randy Huff from California, Jim Manila from California, Paul Kolajewski from New Hampshire, Noreen Davison from New Jersey, Anand Damalapati from Virginia, and Christina Schweiss from Virginia. All in favor, raise your credentials. All opposed? Passes. LMA committee. The Life Member Asset Trust has, an, has a total of 11 trustees. I am pleased to recommend and nominate the following individuals. Frank Camerata, Steve Doyle, Jim Bedenball, Leroy Dubeck, Dove G Gorman, Beatrice Mar Marinello, Alan Priest, Tim Redman, Peter Dyson, Alex Railia, and Chuck Unruh. All those in favor, raise your credentials. Opposed? Chuck, can you give that to Grant so I can type those in? And passes. Give the list. Before you, before you, where's Walter? Walter, you wanted to mention one individual who was forgotten as we did the in passing. Yes. In passing, um, I would say I thought of someone when the, our editor uh, said something. It reminded me, Greg DeFotis died that September. In 1973, you'll see that Norman Weinstein won the US Open. It was actually a five way tie for first. Weinstein, Suttles, Walter Brown, and uh, Ruby Rodriguez from the Philippines. Norman Weinstein won the tie breaks. That's the only name you see. Greg was also part of the first winning high school chess team that Goitschberg started in 1969 with Lane Tech from Chicago. So I uh, wish that he'd be added to the list. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. And Mr. President, may I add, add in something? Yes, my uh, two, two items uh, for business here. Just uh, if anybody does have a 
uh, and it, uh, delegates motion that they wish to write up their reforms uh, in your packets and I believe also on the front table here. Uh, then please get that over to uh, Grant here and we'll get those typed in. Uh, the second announcement is uh, from the Women's Committee. Uh, they need to have your 2018-2019 updated female coordinator uh, uh, nominee from your state. So please see Maureen Grimaud and it's not new, but I'm sure everybody knows Maureen. So I'll see her please sometime this weekend. Thank you. All right, ADM 1807, pursuant to Article 3, Section 10 of the bylaws, the delegates have reviewed the promotional memberships offered by the Executive Board in 2017 and authorized their continuation. There was a handout in the delegate packet that we all got, and I think we can vote on this. It's co-sponsored by Robert Messenger of Massachusetts. Floor is over for discussion. Hearing none, calling for the vote. All those in favor, raise your credentials. All opposed. Motion passes. All right. ADM 1808, against co sponsored by Robert Messenger. The delegates have reviewed the financial information about expenditures and the status of bond funds in the Players Health and Benefits Fund and have approved a report on those items, report required by DM 1151. There is a report in the delegates' call on page 54 by John Donaldson, and I think that meets the requirement. Any discussion? Hearing none, let's call for the vote. All in favor, raise your credentials. All opposed? Motion passes. Uh, ADM 1809 was the referral of ADM 1659 that had been referred to rules in 2016. It was re-referred to the executive board in 2017 when it was considered here. The uh, concept that organizers having their events rated by US Chess, as well as another rating service are required to disclose all the players and all other rating services. Um, it was referred to the executive board for consideration. The executive board made the determination that uh, we didn't uh, think that we needed to do that. The consideration came out of some folks who had an event, had, had a player who had been rated by um, an alternative rating service. And what has actually happened is the uh, Scholastic community in the process of determining whether or not to use alternative ratings have basically discounted when they're under alternative rating services if there's an extensive history of U.S. chess play, so that one event that shows up in an alternative rating service is not trumping a long period of, uh, of U.S. chess rated play. So we think that's actually resolved the problem. Any discussion? Well, I just want to mention that uh, the, the board asked me to consider the substitute, so I created the substitute. Any discussion? What is the substitute? What? The, board? The, what? The, the board considered the possibility of a of some sort of other substitute motion. And Angelina had worked on that, and the board decided that we did not want to advance any other motion with regard to this issue because we had considered it had been resolved with the change in the way Scholastics is using that information. Point of order, then. Parliamentary inquiry, actually. Is it the case? that this motion is being presented by the executive board, or is it a single person amending the motion? The executive board's status of this motion is that we, we are simply reporting that we're taking no action on it because the Scholastic Council, in their consideration of how they use alternative rating systems, has resolved that. So this is a proposal, this is a proposal by one delegate to amend the motion on the floor. Correct? That would appear to be the case. It needs a second. <laughs> Do we have a second? Second. Okay. 
Discussion? Uh, Christine Dennison from Iowa. I'm, uh, I I'm wondering, are there any other implications apart from the, the USCF tournaments? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't see what is wrong with like having something that promotes transparency. If there's, I, I, I'm not really understanding why we wouldn't want to have a rule like this. Well, the, as Alan stated, the original issue arose two years ago at the National Elementary when a young lady uh, had a Chess Express rating that referenced an older U.S. Chess rating. And because the older U.S. Chess rating happened to be higher than her current U.S. Chess rating, and the way the scholastic regulations were written at that time, the chief tournament director was required to use the higher but older U.S. chess rating from that alternate rating service. And during the discussion of this with the parents, because the little girl was in like second grade, I think, during discussion of this with the parents, what became obvious was that the, the, uh, the fact that this alternative rating system was being used by the tournament director was completely unannounced to any of the players. So they had absolutely no knowledge that this alternative rating system was being used. So the way we knew that it could get corrected was to fix the scholastic regulation so that the player's most current U.S. chess regulation, I mean, U.S. chess uh, rating would be used in such cases. So that resolved that problem. And that's the transparency issue right there is that the the, um, uh, as a part of the ratings process in preparations for these tournaments, whenever a player has an alternate rating that is going to be referenced for rating per for, uh, for pairing purposes, for prize purposes, and for sectioning purposes, the parents or coach or player in some cases are notified by the U.S. Chess Office that that's what's going to occur. And that occurs after a decision is made between the scholastics uh, representative to the tournament, the chief tournament director, and, uh, the director of na and the director of events. So that triumvirate makes a decision, and then that from, from, from transparency's, transparency's perspective, it is communicated to the parents or to the coach or to the player that the rating system that was used to determine a rating that's higher than what they have published in US Chess is the following, and so they're told what's going on. And they do have a chance to appeal that. That's part of the that's part of the transparency process, also. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Is it the intent of the maker of this motion to amend the USCF Code of Ethics or to provide direction to the Ethics Committee? Uh, can you repeat the question? Do you intend to modify the USCF the US Chess Code of Ethics or provide direct direction to the Ethics Committee? Yeah, well, yeah. I. I the idea was to uh, to use the motion, uh, and uh, I think the main concern was uh, what do we do if that uh, that advice is not followed by the organizers. So this is not uh, completely amend uh, changing the ethics. Uh, it's more just to uh, provide the guidance and. I, I, well, okay, I understand that, but as written, this appears to amend the U.S. US Chess Code of Ethics and also provide specific direction to the Ethics Committee on how they should proceed. Well, and as such, I object to that. Okay. I disagree that this that this motion appears to modify the Code of Ethics. It says that in failure to disclose is may result in an ethics complaint. I don't think an ethics complaint. I don't think every type of ethics complaint must be predefined by, by the Code of Ethics. So I disagree with the previous statement that this redefines the Code of Ethics or seeks to def redefine it. Okay. Ken? The previous speaker might note that the instructions for filing an ethics complaint explicitly state that the complainant must state in the complaint which points in the Code of Ethics were violated. Therefore, I raise a point of information. Which, which element in the Code of Ethics, which item in Section 6 of the Code of Ethics in the delegates call does such behavior violate? 
I'm guessing that this is a failure to follow the rules. I don't have the I don't have the code of ethics in front of me. Yeah, but in the delegate code. It's in the delegate code. Al. Well, well, to some extent, I think that this particular motion um, addresses a real issue that incorrectly. Um, in that specific case you're talking about, the particular ratings organization, if you will, accepts submissions from players, coaches, or organizers. So, in fact, we do not know that the organizers submitted that tournament to this rating service. Um, and by the way that particular rating service goes, it's perfectly possible for a coach to game the system by submitting tournaments that any of his opponents have played in. Um, and I'd rather see a substitute motion, uh, or actually not even a motion, I would rather see the, the uh, uh, Scholastic Council uh, determine that ratings that are created in that way just shouldn't even be considered uh, in our formula. Because uh, in this case and in most other cases, those ratings are just a subset of your USCF rating. It doesn't make sense to, to, to use them. But I don't think a delegate motion is appropriate for that. So I think we should uh, either defeat or table indefinitely this motion um, with the understanding that the Scholastic Council uh, will reevaluate that. Okay, I want to remind everyone what we're discussing right now is the proposed substitute. And then once we finish the discussion on that, we will vote on that, yay or nay. And then we will return to the discussion of the original motion before voting on it. Steve? I, as an answer to a point of order previously raised, which specific point of the code of ethics does, uh, would be violated by this, would be grounds for submitting an ethics complaint? Standards of conduct, 6A, intentional violations of tournament regulations or of any other regulations pertaining to USCF activities and goals, particularly after being warned. I would submit that would qualify as a grounds for submitting an ethics complaint in this case. This uh, motion, proposed substitute, was brought to the executive board as an alternative. It was defeated by the executive board. Why the maker has chosen to go around the executive board presented as a delegate's motion is it would be addressed to the maker um, as so therefore I urge it to be defeated the executive board has already considered this and actually defeated this motion once uh, just a point of information here to Al's point about players and coaches using the system I think that the two player the two thing we have between the scholastic council and with the chief TD will solve some of these problems that we have a human element here so if they notice something that's wrong with somebody's rating that that group of people will be able to solve each solution and section everybody appropriately because I think that's the objective here the objective is to get the right players in the right sections regardless of using other rating systems or even US chess ratings so that's the objective here it's not for any other purpose okay. John Hartman Nebraska I call the question Okay, the question has been called. Thank All those, any objections to calling the question? I object. Okay, so now we'll vote on the objection. All those who favor the objection. No, no, calling calling the question. Question. All those who favor calling the question, raise your credentials. Opposed to calling the question. The question has been called. I call now for the vote on the substitute motion. All those in favor of the substitute motion, raise your credentials. All those opposed to the substitute motion. The substitute motion is defeated. With the period of discussion is now open for the original motion. I move to postpone indefinitely the main motion. Motion has been made and second to postpone indefinitely the, mo the original motion. Um, so. Point of Any? order. The word indefinitely seems to be an interminable word. Can it we is. just say I wish to see <laughs> it postponed? The motion and to postpone. 
The motion to postpone indefinitely is a subsidiary motion that may be applied to a main motion to basically make the motion go away. It's similar to withdrawing the motion. I make the motion to uh, postpone indefinitely because, in my opinion, the executive board has actually solved the problem. There's no more action needed. This is the parliamentary way to dispose of the motion. And a motion to postpone indefinitely is actually a Robert's Rules of Order stated type of motion. I mean, that's why the language is being used, correct, yeah. Mr. Parliamentary? Uh, yeah. It is You may ask for a point of clarification. I believe that the substitute as worded goes against the message, the mission of the this the organization. The substitute, the substitute, the substitute. I know that, but let me just ask you, do we need to list sanctions in a motion, thou shalt or you're going to get spanked by your mother? Anybody who's going to file a complaint is going to file a complaint. Would we have been more order. open to that if out of order. without the punishment? Yeah, it's out of order. That's the question. I know. So what's open to discussion right now is the the motion to um, uh, I'll defer and indef postpone indefinitely. I'm, I'm speaking for Ken's side here on this one as one of the makers of the original motion. I think the executive board and the Scholastic Council have both have a unique policy set for situations like this, and I think it's been solved. So for the, it's an ongoing issue, this whole thing. And I think it's been solved that year by year, we're gonna to continue to look at players with alternate rating systems, with players with problems with US chess ratings or any rating before they enter National Scholastic. So I think the issue is moot, honestly. It's not our motion, it's the board's motion. No, it's his motion. No. To table, to, to, to postpone. Uh, Jim Minnell in New York. Uh, I have to disagree with my colleague. Uh, can you hear me? I have to disagree with my colleague from the Ethics Committee. Uh, I would much prefer to vote the motion up or down and dispose of it that way. Uh, personally, I don't see any problem with requiring somebody to reveal some, some information. You're not requiring them to do anything else, but it seems like the will of the body is that they don't want to do that, so then let's just vote it up or down. I move the question on the motion to postpone indefinitely. Second. Question's been called. Any objections to calling question? All in favor of postponing indefinitely, raise your hands. All those opposed, it passes. <laughs> Okay, ADM 1810. ADM 1810 was referred to the Ethics Committee for <coughs> in 2017 for report to the delegates in 2018. I did report it in my annual report and I will cover that briefly here. To, to familiarize everyone with what the original motion was, the original motion is that was to change the U.S. Chess Code of Ethics so that any member who is under the age, originally it, it, the motion said, I believe 18, but then it became 13 as, a, as, uh, as amended, would be handled by the Scholastic Committee. This was discussed in many committees last year, and the, as noted, it was referred to the Ethics Committee in 2017. The Ethics Committee made a change to their internal procedures which is in uh, my committee report. I will get to the right page here. I will. Forty-nine. Thank you. Uh, page forty-nine. The report to the delegates on ADM uh, seventeen thirty-one. The bolded uh, column in the right-hand column of page forty-nine. This is the procedure we adopted. 
The committee shall annually report an ombudsman from among its members who shall have responsibility for reviewing complaints in which the potential respondent is below 13 years of age. The ombudsman will examine the complaint and shall have authority to dismiss it outright, refer it to the full committee for a formal jurisdiction review, refer it to another committee, or to seek an informal negotiated settlement by communicating directly with the complainant and the respondent. The complainant shall have the right to appeal the ombudsman's decision to the full committee, in which case the normal jurisdiction procedures will apply. Now, I would like to make a couple of notes there. This is, our, this is the procedure we are following right now. It is being presently used for the first time. So we are still trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work. There may be need to be tweaking to our procedure, which the, we believe the Ethics Committee is capable of doing. We believe this addressed the, uh, the need of the original motion, which was for very young members have a procedure in place prior to the accepting of jurisdiction of a formal ethics complaint that could resolve the matter informally if that was appropriate. We have put that procedure in place, but it, ins it, it involves just members of the ethics committee. We are not involving liaisons or anyone else. We believe this addressed the issue of the motion. In the ethics workshop, there was a straw poll, and the straw poll was 20 to nothing that we had, in fact, that this internal procedure addressed the original motion and no further action was necessary. Any discussion? Hearing none, I call the vote. Hold on. We haven't proposed any resolution to the motion, so. I suppose, uh, well, I, I will propose to, uh, that 1810 be postponed indefinitely. Thank Motion's you for teaching. Second to postpone indefinitely. Any discussion on postponing indefinitely? Hearing none, all those in favor of indefinite postponement, raise your credentials. Opposed? Postponing indefinitely passes. EDM 1811. All right, uh, 1811 last year was, re 1811 last, kiss it. <laughs> last year was referred to the bylaws committee and it seemed evident that what the delegates wanted was a shorter version. This is conflict of interest and probably no necessity to sign annual statements each year. So we appointed a subcommittee headed by Gary Walters, former U.S. Chess President, and Gary worked on it and we came up with 1812, which is a substitute. Now, I'm not talking it. All right, 1812 came up from the committee as a substitute. At the bylaws workshop, the vote was 1900 in favor of 1812, and 0180 against 1811, and the committee unanimously supported 1812. Now, there was uh, one slight wording change suggested at the workshop for 1812. If you go down on page seven, where it says Article Four, then the idea was to assert a comma after, in the last sentence, last line of Article Four, after adopted children and the uh, workshop and the committee are fine with that. But we do think 12 is a lot simpler and clearer than 11, and our urging this body would do to, to vote in favor of ADM 1812. Alan. Mr. President, as the original maker of 1811, could I suggest, could I, I make a motion that we suspend the rules and consider 1812 first. If 1812 passes, my contention is it would moot 1811. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Any discussion about suspending the rules? Point of inquiry is 
suspending the rules require a simple majority? Two thirds. Two thirds. Let's call the vote on the suspension. All those in favor, raise your credentials. Opposed? Passes almost unanimously. Now I'm at the mic to speak in favor of 1812. The purpose of 1811 had been to get something in place because the delegates have director powers in certain areas. And the Internal Revenue Service asked that all nonprofits have conflict of interest policies for its directors. The text of 1811 is the conflict of interest policy that the executive board follows, and it is way too complicated for the delegates. That was recognized. So I appreciate the opportunity of uh, the bylaws committee taking it seriously and coming up with a much more workable alternative. It does not call, call for annual statements or anything. It's just if there's any delegate that looks at the agenda, sees something in which they think they may have a conflict of interest, they have a duty to disclose that. The delegates then will have a committee to consider if that requires, if they would recommend to that delegate that they recuse themselves from the consideration of that issue. It seems to solve the problem in a way that we can actually make it function and I really appreciate the work of the bylaws committee to make that happen. I urge the people, the delegates to vote in favor of this. Any other discussion? Uh, Alan, I, Alan, I, Ernest Schlick, Virginia. Alan, I do have one question. With the elimination of the uh, annual signing by the delegates, uh, have you investigated whether we need language elsewhere when somebody's appointed a delegate, say they agree to follow it? Can I answer that from here? And bylaws, this is your notion. Can I answer that question? Because I sure. think I can. Um, the delegates only really exercise anything when they come into meeting. So if the delegates aren't considering anything, it doesn't really become a problem until there's something for them to consider. So a delegate who might be appointed to fill a vacancy, oh, let's say next week, then the next time if we had a special meeting and called everybody into session, if they had a conflict on that, that's when they would disclose it. So there is no requirement to do anything in writing. It would just happen at that meeting. Well, I was thinking, uh, I guess the purpose of signing it uh, is to say that you will abide by the policy. And I'm thinking of we're sitting here in the meeting and somebody comes up on some ADM where somebody might have a conflict of interest and then it goes to court and they're arguing that that conflict consistence statement does not apply to them whether we need it in writing somewhere that says by serving as a delegate at an annual meeting, you agree to abide by the uh, conflict of interest. Well, I don't think that's necessary. My intention, if this passes, it would be in the delegate's action of continuing interest. It would be available if the delegate's call. Therefore, anybody coming to the meeting would see it and be aware of it. And, and Ernie, I appreciate your concern. That's certainly why it is a signature requirement of the executive board. Remember, the executive board is the only body that can actually contract on behalf of the federation. So that, that's why this just didn't need to be as complicated, I think, because we, the delegates can exercise certain director powers, but they are very limited. And y'all are only here one weekend a year. We're dealing with stuff every week. So, um, so I, I, Ernie, I appreciate the concern. I just think that the way they've dealt with it solves the problem. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or raise your credentials. All those opposed, raise credentials. Motion passes. Mr. President, then I would request that you rule 1811 is being moved. I rule that 1811 is moot. Now we're on to 1813. The state's committee considered this.
the committee was not in favor of it. Uh, some people actually disliked it intensely. Got to get closer to the mic. Huh? Oops. The workshop vote on this was seven in favor, 20 opposed, with two abstaining. So the state's the state's committee and the workshop recommend the defeat of this motion. Any discussion on this motion? Hearing none. Call the vote on motion 1813. All those in favor of the change language in 1813, raise your hands. Raise your credentials. All opposed to the change language. The motion is the motion is defeated. The language is not changed. That concludes the old business. We now move into we now move into new business. Okay. Yeah, that's what they're, they're trying to get it up on the screen now. While they're working on this, let me give Alan and I will give some backdrop on, on what we're about to talk about. What we're about to talk about is the Connecticut State Chess Association and the challenge from the reformed Connecticut State Chess Association to replace the Connecticut State Chess Association. The reformed CSCA, under the terms of the, of the specifications of the bylaws, submitted their credentials to U.S. Chess right at the end of May, ahead of the required June 1st deadline. And according to the bylaws, the executive board is required to make a recommendation to this body no later than 30 days prior to the meeting, which is the email that all of you received that laid out what the RCSCA said in their claim with their credentials. CSCA's counter to what was said, uh, and then the executive board recommendation. And what we're putting up now is the, a summary of the executive board recommendation. In essence, and I'll read the language when they finish typing, what the executive board recommended was that, first of all, U.S. Chess did rec already recognizes CSCA as the state chapter for Connecticut, and they have been since the 1960s. However, the RS RCSCA has properly submitted its credentials to U.S. Chess under the specifications of Article 8, Section 1 of the bylaws. Some executive board members felt that CSCA should be decertified now and the RCSCA given a chance to govern. However, at the present time, the executive board does not recommend the RCSCA replace the existing CSCA as the state chapter for Connecticut. Instead, the executive board recommends that the CSCA be placed on notice effective immediately until the 2019 delegates meeting that their status as the state chapter is under review by the delegates. Got it all in there, Mike? It's not an ADM. Yeah. Okay. That's why there's no ADM number. It would be an NDM. Okay, so in response to the RCSCA, the Reform Connecticut State Chess Association's challenge to the state chapter affiliate status of the Connecticut State Chess Association, the executive board moves to one. 
place the CSCA on notice effective immediately until the 2019 delegates meeting that their status as the state chapter is under review by the delegates. That's the number one you see there. Number two, under the authority of Article 7, Section 3, committees of the U.S. Chess bylaws that the delegates would appoint a special committee of three to five persons who are not from Connecticut to oversee the period leading up to the next delegates meeting and any attempts to mediate the dispute. The special committee will provide a report with recommendations to this body at the 2019 annual meeting. The committee's report shall be ready for the delegates at least one month before the 2019 <coughs> annual meeting. The third point, in an effort to resolve the matter within Connecticut, the CSCA and RCSCA shall agree to conduct face-to-face third-party mediation using a mediator agreed upon by both parties and at no expense to U.S. Chess. This process shall begin no later than November 30th, 2018, at a time and place agreeable to the CSCA and the RCSCA. Do I have a second? Second. The motion has been second. The floor is open for discussion. So on, your, on the third point of them agreeing to meet face to face and have arbitration, what happens if one of them does not agree? Then there is no arbitration. Uh, yeah, mediation. It's not arbitration, it's mediation. There is no mediation. And such failure to participate would be noted in the report of the committee. That's correct. Um, in the absence of Mike on Wednesday because of a work conflict, he had asked me to present this to the workshop. And uh, for those of you all who were at the workshop, you know one of the primary thrusts for us as an executive board to sort of kick the can down the road a little bit was the constraints that we had in the bylaws. The bylaws allow this presentation to be made as late as the 1st of June, and that's about the time we got it. It requires us to make a recommendation to you all 30 days before this meeting. So we basically had a month. There, were, there are charges and counter charges in place between the two parties. There is an active ethics case between these parties that depending on the resolution of that could have a bearing on all of this stuff. That ethics case is nowhere close to being resolved. It will be, uh, Dave, it'll be several months yet at best before it's resolved, could be the end of the year or first quarter of 2019. And all of that will have an impact on this situation. Therefore, the executive board just did not think we could recommend one group or the other to you. And we also thought it was best that you all, who have to make this decision, have the ability to do some more research and have a lot more information about this before we go on. There are actions on the part of both parties that are admirable. There are actions on the part of both parties that would probably be considered by most reasonable people to be less than admirable. And so it, uh, it, it has a, it's a very complex situation that we simply did not have time that we thought to be able to bring y'all a good proposal on it. So therefore, I'm encouraging you all to give us some support and uh, vote in favor of this motion. Form a committee and let them work. I'll lower that because I know I'm too tall. Okay, in the rear. Uh, Chris Prosser from Tennessee. Well, this okay. is a weak mic. Um, a question first and possibly an alternate motion. How many voting age members are there in Connecticut that are USCF members? Do we know off the top of our heads? <coughs> About. That's actually irrelevant because there are probably Connecticut State Chess Association members who are not U.S. Chess members. Well, I wouldn't think it would be irrelevant because we're, this is the USCF body. We have no control or say over non-USCF members. If this happened in my state, what I would want is the USCF members in my state to decide who represented us to the U.S. Chess Federation. Now, the non-USCF members can pick whoever they want to represent them, but as far as a representative to the U.S. Chess Federation, I would want the U.S. Chess Federation members in my state to decide that. 
and maybe an alternate motion or idea, for the, if, if it's not cost prohibitive, send a letter to each U.S. voting age U.S. Chess Federation member in Connecticut and say, who do you want to represent you to the U.S. Chess Federation? It would be a very simple process. For, you could do it done in two weeks, and, and it I would solve the problem with those members. I call and, and was shot down for the reason I just said. But I was actually in favor of that proposal as well. Okay, that that makes a lot more sense to let those members decide. Yeah, who's I, agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree, too. Would you address that issue from the state's workshop? Yes. Um, Yes, Her Harold uh, brought up this idea and wanted to have the Connecticut members vote. Uh, the idea being that 50% uh, of them would have to uh, pick one of the, uh, the choice of none of the above wasn't considered for the ballot, but could be. But that motion failed. So the workshop went, decided to go with a board recommendation by a vote of 22 in f favor, zero against, and two abstaining. Uh, point of information, please. Go ahead, David. Point of information, please. If this motion passes, will the executive board be required to give a report to the delegates next year in accordance with the bylaws on the recommendation of of which affiliate, I realize the committee's going to give a recommendation, but would not the executive board also have to give a recommendation to next year's 2019 delegates meeting? Yes, the executive board would, based on the report that we get from the, uh, the special committee that the delegates approve and appoint. Thank you. Uh, John McCrary, South Carolina. <clears throat> Well, what is the legal status of the action that was filed at this point? The legal it was action? dropped. There was a legal action it's filed nice. in, I want to say, November of last year. Mm. And by April, or maybe it's, if it wasn't March, it was April, it was dropped. It was withdrawn by the maker. But Did the, they the withdraw who submitted it? it? He withdrew it. Did they withdraw it? Because at that point in time, as soon as that legal action went in, we stopped all work on the matter. Did, and then was once it, the legal action was withdrawn, we were able to continue with what we were doing. Was it withdrawn with prejudice or without? I think there's a difference. I have no idea. It was just withdrawn from the legal system. Okay. We dropped the case. All right. He I dropped just, it. I don't think the mic's working. Um, I agree with the gentleman from Tennessee. I think I made the wrong way of proposing it at the state's workshop because it seems to me the better way would be that the vote of USCF adult members in Connecticut would be advisory and you would have no requirement therefore about what number of people needed to vote. I mean it just seems to me that the people who know best who should be representing the state are the people who live in Connecticut and are USCF members. Alan. One of the driving matter uh, driving bylaw provisions that President Hoffpower kept bringing us back to on the executive board is contained on page 41 of your delegates call under article 8 organizational unit section 2 functions which follows the section 1 describing what a state chapter is it says each state chapter shall guide the chess activity within the state in a manner that provides representation to all groups of chess players within its state. Yes. I would submit to you that focusing solely on U.S. chess members within a state and defining who the state affiliate is, is an abdication of our responsibility as a 501c3 organization and is against the bylaws of this organization which calls for the affiliate to represent all chess players. I don't think just U.S. chess members can make that determination very effectively and that is something this body has to consider as a whole. We got the bi mic. back mic working. Okay, Al. Pulls off. Well, I, I don't see anything in this motion that would preclude the committee from polling the members in the state and in fact, if I were uh, a member of the committee, which I'm not volunteering for, um, well, we can't appoint. No. I, I would. No, no, it's can't appoint. <laughs> I would. I would uh, uh, probably encourage that action uh, after the committee has 
done the investigation that's necessary. If I were a member, if this were happening in Nevada, oh, it has happened in Nevada. Um, if it were <laughs> happening again in Nevada, um, I would I would want. And, and with all this, and, and I were a member who weren't involved in the, in the two cliques, um, I would want to hear what this mediating committee had to say before I was asked to vote. So I think that the motion as written uh, perfectly covers all of the pros and cons, uh, and we should, and, and I strongly encourage us to pass this motion uh, and further encourage us which will be in a later motion to appoint people smarter than me to be that five-member committee. <laughs> Ernie Schlick, Virginia. Ernie. I have no idea whether uh, the mediation should take place during the ethics complaint or only after it ends. Uh, I think we should either talk about, discuss that and uh, figure out whether we want to say by November 1st or upon conclusion of the ethics or leave it the way it is. Yeah, we actually had that discussion uh, in, the, in the executive board and we decided to leave it as it was. But we did also recognize that depending upon what may be happening with the ethics case, that the instructions that would be provided to the delegate appointed committee might say, hey, wait, let's just hold off because, mm -hmm. you know, Steve oh. Shop, Pennsylvania. If you ask, if you do poll the uh, the players in Connecticut, I would suggest that you give them both sides because too often people go to vote on something they have no idea what they're voting on or who it is. So I would suggest that you present the arguments given by both sides of them. So at least you're going to get an intelligent and informed response from polling. Without, David. without going into the specifics of the case that is before the Ethics Committee, I do want to point out that the matter that the Ethics Committee is considering is not who the state affiliate of the state of Connecticut is. I understand that there are issues related to that, but the Ethics Committee is not going to take a position and is not going to decide which affiliate should represent the state of Connecticut. We explicitly stated that. Steve? Um, I know that we, you want to have neutrality on the committee, but is it 100% necessary that you um, not allow anyone from the state of Connecticut on the committee? I mean, it might be that there could be some person who is knowledgeable because he's from Connecticut on what's going on and would be agreeable by both sides to serve on the committee and by eliminating that person you might be eliminating one of your best um, sources of information. I'm not person. speaking for the board here but I would suggest that if that type of person did in fact step forward that that might be a good mediator as opposed to someone on the committee. Uh, and to further address that issue um, no one from Connecticut showed up for the meeting here. That's from either correct. side. No we, we, we got a lot of people from nearby Connecticut and uh, being from uh, the folks from Connecticut might be a little closer to some other states than for example if this were happening in Texas. You know it's everything's bigger in Texas right so they, they'd be coming from a long way away. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it ain't that hard to get across Connecticut right and find somebody in the next state over. Harold? Right. Um, I have no problem it's working now? Yeah. All right. I have no problem if a committee decides to take a vote of the adult members in Connecticut as an advisory measure. I will point out I do disagree with Alan on his reading of Article 8, Section 2. I think that's a very narrow reading. If you read it that narrowly, you would say that each state chapter would have to provide representation to players who are not members of a state chapter. I'm not aware that that's done. I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, I don't think that wording prohibits taking the vote I've suggested, but I certainly think it might make more sense to simply be an advisory vote. Well, as I mentioned, what I was reading was the clause that President Hoffbauer kept coming back to as we discussed this issue, was that there was a need to represent all chess players in the state in some manner, and under the 50C, 501c3, status that we have. Certainly our mission is broader than simply dealing with members. Kelly Bloomfield from Ohio. Okay, um, Kelly. Question about 
this, this committee could take up to a year uh, as well as the uh, mediation. Uh, what are we going to do for the players in the interim uh, over the next year and how are we going to help them continue with their events and, and overseeing what happens in that state? It sounds like the, the people in place have been some hanky-panky with some money and the, the new ones that have been appointed only represent a very small portion of the state. Those are my two big concerns with, with the issue. I, at this point in time, I don't have a straight up answer other than I do think that, I mean, because there are some important things that need to occur. When you look at some of the DACIs that have, they have responsibilities of what state chapters do, you know, it's to have their, to select people for the Dinker and the Barber, the National Girls Tournament of Champions have a state championship, have a state senior championship, or all in that, in that, have a, and if they want to have a women's championship, but those are all things that are in the, in their lane to do. Um, and there's parts of me that says, I would almost hope we'd hear an outcry from the people of Connecticut asking for help like that, because all we're hearing right now from is a group of about 12 to 15 people. That's it. We've really, really not heard anything from the members, you know, starting to come forward and saying, what's going on? This is hogwash. You know, we got tournaments to play. We need to get our nominees for the different tournaments. We, we need help down here. And that's, that's, we have not heard that uproar yet, but I would not be surprised if we potentially see something like that in the front. Cheryl Larson, Alabama. Uh, in Alabama, we elect our delegate by popular vote, and uh, there are indeed members of the Alabama Chess Federation that are not USCF members. And I would echo, we have the same practice in Virginia. In the back, Dwayne. Dwayne Barber, Southern California. I have already had a difficult, challenging moment regarding the Barber Tournament and its format with regard to Connecticut. I think we have to be concerned, at least I am concerned with the reform group, based on the fact that one of those individuals was involved with that encounter. This can be verified by the co-chairs of all of the other committees. I won't discuss it here, although I could. I think it's for your review group to uh, take a look at, but uh, I'm worried about uh, those invitationals and how they will be managed and uh, whether or not we will get the, uh, how do I say this, appropriate, recognized state champions for each of the event, uh, the girls as well as the others. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Mr. Messenger. Uh, Bob Messenger. Living in New Hampshire, representing Massachusetts, first I wanted to address the question of what happens during the coming year for the players living in Connecticut. And there, I know in the States Committee, we had, some people had discussed, well, because of some of the, the things we didn't like about the way the Connecticut Association was running, we should just suspend that, we should just decertify them. But the problem was, well, then what happens to all the players in that state? So the answer is, there, the Connecticut Chess, Chess Association is on notice, but they're still the state of, they're, they they're still the state chapter. The it's still up to them to perform all the duties of a state uh, chapter, and of course they'll be evaluated in how well they do that. The other thing I wanted to mention is I had offered my my services as a possible mediator. Um, I'm the president of the New England Chess Association, of which Connecticut uh, is a, is a member organization, and I know people on both sides. I'm sorry. Tiny portion there. <laughs> oh, yes. And um, so it, it's, uh, the problem is that since I was in the state's committee, I was not. I wasn't. I was asked not to talk to anybody on either side of it. But if the uh, delegates approve this motion, and if I were on the, the committee, or then I think at that point I could begin conversations with both sides and see if there's any common ground. If there's no common ground, the alternative course would be to advise the, the Reformed Connecticut Association. If they want to have a serious bid to be the state chapter, I think they need to do two things. They need to establish a track record of actually running events. Because right now, we just have five people who got together and wrote a set of bylaws and made an application. But they, have to, they should be prove that they're an organization that can actually represent Connecticut. And second, they need to demonstrate that they have the support 
of the players, the chess players of Connecticut. Like maybe a petition we could talk about, possibly um, a Carol's idea of having a survey. Maybe we could include um, people who weren't U.S. chess me members, including in addition to the U.S. chess members. We have no idea how to contact. I have a point of information. Won't the CSCA continue to represent Connecticut and all the tournaments there until this body replaces them? That yes. is correct. So that shouldn't. We shouldn't have any concern then or question about this interim period of instability if they're going to continue to represent them. Well, we? I think the point was made was that they have the responsibility. Whether they choose to exercise that responsibility is a different matter. And I also wanted to point out, I mean, one of the uh, criticisms of the Connecticut State Chess Association was they weren't following their own bylaws. They have a self-perpetuating board in effect because they only allowed board members to vote on the elections for board members. In closed session. In closed session. Well, so, the, so now the, they have now had a meeting where they did allow other people. Where there's some question about how fair that meeting was, given it was held the same weekend as a major tournament that some of the uh, opposition was attending. But they were they, they're not going to try to start following their bylaws. They need to continue doing that, they need to continue, Start doing they need, well, <laughs> right, they need to allow participation by all the chess players in Connecticut and not just have a closed group of people who are running tournaments for their own benefit. Back uh, the room. Steve Morford, Southern California. I, I just want to get a sense of the current motion as it pertains to the question that's going to keep coming up about, uh, you know, who's selected for the barber and the denker, et cetera. Should I assume, since you're not at the current time decertifying the current uh, group that's running the state, that that would be their responsibility, even though there's going to be heightened supervision? Am that's I correct? correct. That's correct. That's the sense of the motion. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jim Minella, Southern California. I think it's important that we all step back for just one second and remember that at this point in time, it is a he said, she said situation. All right, nothing has been proven. There are claims, there are counterclaims. I don't know who's telling the truth. I'm on the ethics committee. I have no idea at this point what was going on in Connecticut, what is going on in Connecticut. I just have claims in front of me. How do you resolve that? Well, the ethics committee is going to get statements from people and we're going to look at it. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the executive board appointing another committee to actually investigate and talk to people in Connecticut and find out what was going on. It makes perfect sense, all right? To do anything else would be to pass judgment without due process, and I don't think we want to do that. So, you, so you're contending that if the delegates appoint a committee, that's passing judgment? No, no, no. no. You said I'm to do saying anything else. To do anything Supporting. else but appoint the committee to investigate would be passing and judgment so without due process. Vote for it. He's yeah. Vote for yeah. It. Okay? So they appoint the committee either from the delegates or right. from the state so committee. So if we don't yeah, if we don't do mind. if we don't pass this motion and we pass some other motion to pass judgment, I think we're gonna get ourselves into trouble. Yeah. Now, Steve Emmett, I believe, said well, shouldn't somebody from Connecticut be on that committee? Uh, because maybe they know more about it. I think it's absolutely imperative that nobody from Connecticut is on the committee. If, or uh, as a mediator. He could be a mediator. A mediator maybe, but not on the committee. Because if this person that knows everything that's going on and, and is impartial exists, he would be somebody the committee would want to talk to and not necessarily have on the committee because that would yeah. just look, it would just look bad for, for no other reason. Appearance of conflict of interest? Appearance of conflicts of interest. Even if none existed, it would look like one might. Okay, Marie. All right. Thank you. Um, a concern I have is with the four invitationals. If it's my understanding that this year this proposal would be a period of uh, mediation during that period because the two associations we uh, they are allowed to continue is that my understanding or? no the, the Connecticut State Chess Association remains the state chapter 
and has all those responsibilities to exercise as the state chapter okay. until they are removed by this body. Okay, un understood. Now, during the year, while they are allowed to perform their obligations, my concern would be if we are involving the four invitationals and we do need to have their information by the end of the year for this U.S. Open, um, if there should be any kind of entanglement during the process or in that process because of this feud going on, how would uh, U.S. Chess protect, you know, what we're doing <laughs> would be my question, I guess, in case there would be another potential lawsuit if we're trying to well, get invitations. If there's a lawsuit, it stops. Everything that we are doing as a body would stop instantly, okay. and we could go no further if a lawsuit occurs. Okay. And even the ethics, but if it if it impacts the ethics action, mm -hmm. it would halt the ethics action as well. Okay. If there was not a lawsuit, but if there was potential potential litigation there, then would that be included in with this? It's I don't know. The, the responsibility to for, to exercise all the chapter obligations remains with the existing state affiliate. To the extent that they fulfill those obligations or not, it's the same as any other state. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a point of information regarding Taker qualification in Connecticut. I was actually told a story by a player and their parent about the qualification for Danker in Connecticut. That they changed the process to a multitude of tournaments and not a state championship. It was very confusing to understand. And they said that somebody was trying to manipulate how to get somebody nominated for the Danker with this way. So the entire state and how they handle this is also can be called into question regarding how they nominate players for all four of these invitations. So I just want to make that clear. Okay, that I think it's irrelevant to the motion that we're It discussing. is, but I'm making it clear that that's regarding all the Danker participants. John. Yeah, point of information. This year, both sides to this agreed to the nominees for the events. But I want to call the motion. Can't. Can't. But, but guess who's next in line? I chose the question. Yes. Question has been called. Any objections to calling the question? The question? No, it has not been objected to. So now we're voting on the motion. Yeah. So now we vote on the motion. As read, do I need to read the motion again? No. Good. Okay, I'm glad. All those in favor, raise your credentials. Opposed, raise your credentials. Passes. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to move that this, the results of this election be reported back with the count, the vote count. I don't know, I guess you didn't count the number of abstentions or no votes, but at least I think it would be important to report back to both parties that this motion passed unanimously. Do I need to, why wouldn't we just say you passed unanimously? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't everyone. I mean, I saw That's two or three unanimous. hands up. That so. is not unanimous. Overwhelming. There were okay, so you didn't ask is, do you ask for a motion to have a, vote, uh, a hand count? Uh, no. Just, well, We'll report that it passed overwhelmingly. Okay. Dwayne? I wanted to second what I thought was a motion requesting a count that be available and be forwarded to the two parties involved. Didn't you make such a motion, Steve? The motion's out of order. My motion was that I thought it had passed unanimously, but then there were no abstentions that were called for. What's the problem, Jerry? Regrettably, this body regularly makes the mistake of referring to a vote to abstain. Logically, that is absolute nonsense. The definition of abstention is not casting a vote, period. It indicates by abstaining the member indicates that he is willing to accept the will of the body, whatever that will is. There is no vote to abstain. Steve, 
<laughs> votes, if you vote to abstain, that still counts as a vote not cast in the affirmative for purposes of, for example, the two-thirds majority. <laughs> that is actually incorrect. If there were three members of the body to vote, two vote in favor of a motion, one votes against, everyone else abstains, then a two-thirds majority of the votes cast have passed the motion. <laughs> okay, so now that the motion is passed, what we would like to do as an executive board is to ask from this body if there are volunteers who would be willing to step forward to be part of the committee. Otherwise, we already know who we selected. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but if there are people who would like to step forward, we would like to know that. And we will report later on back to the body who has stepped forward to be part of that body so that the delegates can then vote on those people forming that committee. Jump, jump up and do it now. Talk to us later. And we'll bring it back later. And then we'll bring it up as we get the team together. Is that cool? Okay, now we're up to motions that have come out of the member meeting. All right, I mean, the first motion already is self-enforcing. Yeah. The first motion already was self-enforcing. That was simply to elect additional delegates to this meeting. But the second motion I do co-sponsor with Guy Hoffman, Myron Lieberman, and Gerald Larson. And uh, Ken Sloan added his name as well. All right, this is something that we are in agreement with what the executive board did. We just want to make sure that it's completely legal. Because what happened is there's a delegate action of continuing interest that says the U.S. Open can end no later than the 15th of August. However, it's been a desire of this whole group to go to have a U.S. Open in the St. Louis area so that everyone can get a chance to see the museum. And this year, the Sunday of that weekend ends on the 16th, not the 15th. So uh, what was passed is the members recommend to the delegates that delegate action of continuing interest 24 be amended as follows. An exception is made for the 2020 U.S. Open so that the 2020 U.S. Open can take place near the World Chess Hall of Fame. I believe this was passed overwhelmingly by the members' meeting. Discussion? Uh, Steve Warford, Southern California. Okay. I'm requesting a slightly larger font for those of us sitting in the back <laughs> so that we can all read what's up there. That's my old move. Oh, oh, sir. Uh, Chris Kim from Maryland. This is a point of information question. Why is, um, why is it that August 15th was set as a deadline as of 1999, 2001, and 2010, just for clarification, since that wasn't around at that time? I think the concern, and I think Alexi Root was one of those behind this, was to make sure it would not interfere with the beginning of a school term, whether it's a college term or a lesser school term. And that's why the August 15th date was put in. Mr. Kinslow, could sure. you could you address this issue? Because I don't think you heard the question, and I know you have were an original maker of this motion. Right. The question was raised as to what the purpose of this deadline motion was, and I know you can speak eloquently to oh, that. Uh, the purpose of this motion was purely personal interest. Uh, I had started, <laughs> <laughs> and I said that at the time. Uh, I had started bringing my son to the U.S. Open, and um, for example, in Hawaii, I brought, I think, three kids to Hawaii to go to the U.S. Open. And then the very next year, uh, the U.S. Open was scheduled, so that in order for them to attend the U.S. Open, they'd have to miss the first week of school. Right? This event was originally advertised and, and uh, promoted as a family event. 
bring everybody, have a good time, have a vacation, the games are spread out over a long period of time, all of that stuff. And as a result, I propose that the uh, end date be uh, the 15th, um, which you know, doesn't solve the problem for everybody. Fortunately, it solved the problem for me. Well, that was long enough ago that I don't have kids anymore, so I, no. Um, <laughs> personally, I think uh, the board made a mistake in making this decision without, well, I guess they, did, they thought they didn't have time, or I guess they thought they could just do it, and what could we do about it? I think that was a mistake. But once having been done, I think the reasons are, um, are perfectly valid, and that's why I support this motion. Just for the information of the body, in the, the, the board actually passed a motion citing this particular provision and saying that there was no intention to waive this date in perpetuity, that these were the only dates we have been able to get with a whole lot of work under any venue in St. Louis, and that the desire that we knew a lot of people had to have one of these events in St. Louis that it fell, you know, the 15th is a Saturday, 16th is a Sunday, that we felt that the need to do the St. Louis, that we were keeping as close as we could to it. Yeah. Reasonable people can disagree with that, and I certainly recognize that. And, you know, again, speaking as the maker of the original motion, I guess you'd put this in the category of close enough for government work. It kind of was that, yes, sir. Had, had the proposal come back to have this event in St. Louis, the only dates we could have it, it was going to end on the 25th of August, I think you would not have found the level of support among the executive board. The 16th was, you know, you're not going to get to school any quicker if it ended on Saturday the 15th as opposed to Sunday the 16th. It looked like no harm, no foul, frankly. Yep, okay. Well, not quite, but okay. I, I did. <laughs> Call the question. The question has been called. Are there any objections to calling the question? Hearing none, we vote on the motion. All those in favor, raise your credentials. Opposed? Motion passes almost unanimously. There's one guy in the back. <laughs> okay, the next member meeting motion. Bob, is that you? Yes. Yeah. It's Bob. Okay. This, this is Bob Messenger, representing Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. This motion came up in the membership meeting. Um, resolved members that um, to uh, replace uh, Rule 10 I2, Variation 1. Rook touched first. This is if a player intending to cast a touches the rook first, the standard penalty. The current, the current rule says that there's no penalty. But if, there's, if you can't castle, you have to move the rook. The revised, the, the proposed new rule is if you try to castle, if you castle touching the rook first, there's a two minute penalty. And, and the, the rest of it's the same in terms of if you can't castle, you um, have to move the rook. And the, it's a variation which does not need to be announced. The main rule is if you touch the rook first when you castle, then you have to move the rook, you can't castle. And that's the FIDE rule. And the motivation for this motion is, we have, especially, see our young kids, they play in, in US chess scholastics, and they can castle with the rook first, no penalty, no problem, and they, can, so they think that's, that's perfectly okay. Then they play in something like the Denker Barber, or they play in the World Youth, and guess what, when they castle touching their rook first, they have to move the rook and they probably they might lose the game or at least have a very serious disadvantage. So this is, <laughs> so the purpose of this is to push, I mean, the main rule imposes the same penalty FIDE does, which is you have to move the rook. The variation is less severe than that, but we, by imposing a penalty, we make it clear to the player that when you castle, you're supposed to move the king first. And the two minute penalty isn't gonna make them lose the game or anything, it's just to make them aware that the proper way to do it is king first, not, not touch the rook first. Steve? Point of information, there is also a variation to the main rule currently in existence that says that you will, are not required to uh, move the rook first if you touch the rook. So that's, the main rule is as what Bob said, 
and the variation that exists now is that the current variation says that you're not um, required to, to castle if you uh, touch your rook first. For as far as the um, motion goes, I believe this is a, a potential source of a lot of disputes in tournaments. I know that there are some players who do play in FIDE tournaments, but there are many, many more players, especially young players, who do not play in FIDE rated tournaments. And I, I believe this introduces a new source of disputes, for example, uh, stopping the game when a player says he touched his rook first, no I didn't, yes he did, stopping the games next to them to see if yes, what if he did touch his rook first, didn't touch his rook first, and the whole process of uh, a touch move violation which interferes with the orderly progress of the games. I think this is that's necessary in some cases. I don't think it's necessary to introduce a new source of disputes in a game, especially in games where there may be young children involved. And I, I think this is, again, a sort of a slide down the road to using FIDE rules in situations. There are a lot of other FIDE rules that are different than USCF rules. There's rules about what happens when you, lo you lose the game by making two illegal moves under FIDE rules. There's other things that are different than US, US chess rules. And I don't think it's necessary this is a necessary situation to accommodate players because there's a lot of other differences as well. And there are a lot of players who don't play in FIDE tournaments. They play in US uh, chess tournaments. And I think there's many more of them than there are who play in, in FIDE tournaments. David. Uh, this came up in the workshop. The vote by the workshop was 17 in favor and three opposed. Tim. Yeah, Steve and I were opposed. We actually agreed on something. That tells you how strongly, strongly Steve and I feel about this. Oh, come so on. So you're not folks. calling I, the question, is that right? No, I'm okay. not. I, I have sure. a substitute motion. Just want to make sure. Uh, substitute motion to the makers of, of this motion. Let's just eliminate the um, replacement Let's replace uh, 10I2, get rid of it. Get rid of the amendment which currently says what the old rule said. You can just castle, touch the rook first, blah, 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 blah. How about we just put the two together, the um, main rule and the amendment, and say touching the rook first requires a two minute penalty, thus satisfying the people making this particular motion added to the opponent's clock, or a warning at the discretion of the tournament director, thus satisfying Steve's concerns. Castling is still allowed if legal. Second. We've had a substitution proposed. As a substitution, I guess the makers of the motion can accept it or not. Okay, that's, I heard it not accepted in back of me. Right, that's actually not not just able to be replaced because it's a motion that has been passed by the membership meeting and therefore belongs to the membership meeting, but I would not accept it anyway. So it's a motion to amend. Okay. <laughs> I bow to the parliamentarian. <laughs> so the motion to amend has been seconded. So now we, any discussion on the motion to amend? Yes. Abel Talamantes, Northern California. Uh, well, hold on a second. Get, get, what I'd like to do is finish the, the yeah. to get the amended version somehow expressed so that ever all the members and all the delegates can see what this amendment Pam. that's proposed looks like. Pam, hello, Pam. Pam, it's up, it's up there. Is it? It's the bottom half of the screen. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. 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 Got it. Okay. Continue. Yes. Abel Talamantes, Northern California. Just for consideration in, in uh, talking about some of the, the potential consequences of that, we deal with a lot of scholastic tournaments where we're at. Um, a lot of those events involve players rated under 1,000. 
and a lot of them we don't force them to use clocks. So I would just throw out there that there has to be some other consideration of a type of penalty if we're going to do that can't be a time penalty because we just don't have that to do. David? Uh, I would submit that this is handled in any way, the same way as you have a time penalty specified in the rule book where the opponents aren't using a clock. It, if you do, are not using a clock, that doesn't mean that a time penalty shouldn't be part of the rule. It may limit your ability to enforce the rule, I understand that, but saying that we shouldn't have a rule just because scholastic players don't use clocks, that doesn't quite make sense to me. Because if players aren't using clocks, the director's going to have to deal with that in the same way they'd have to deal with it in the rule book today for anything that specifies a penalty. Find an alternate penalty, find an alternate solution. You can't enforce a, a time penalty when there's no clock. I got it. But that doesn't mean we should throw out the entire penalty. Ernie? Uh, I am against uh, merging the two. I uh, prefer that our players follow the rules as how to move, how to castle, how to move the king is very clear on this. If the scholastic community wants to have the variation, I'll live with it. Uh, that way each tournament director can make its own decision depending upon the type of event he's running. But I urge defeat of this amendment. Steve. Well, right now, the amendment, as, as worded, allows for the time penalty to be assessed, the direction, it, it doesn't force it to be assessed. In other words, the people who want the time penalty can have it. What it doesn't allow is the people who want the time penalty to force me to make the time penalty in my in tournaments I direct. I would prefer to make that judgment call as organizer or director myself. I respect the other people's right to make a time penalty in games where they want to, but I don't think it's correct that they mandate that for tournaments, for all tournaments. Uh, Grant Owen. <laughs> I feel like an idiot. There's a, and I made the mistake, not Grant. See where it says 10I1? I want to replace 10I2. It's just an error on my part naming something. You, we're not eliminating 10, 10 I2, we're going to replace it. This is, this is the primary rule wouldn't, we're getting rid of the, the, we're combining what is currently the amendment and the main rule of 10 I2, just dumping it all together. Bob? Yes, that's an improvement, but the other thing that the other thing that, that uh, Tim's amendment does is I, all, all my motion did was change the variation. The main rule currently is if you castle um, and touch the rook first, you have to move the rook. This amendment would throw that away and, and would say that you never have to move the rook. It's either a two-minute penalty or a warning at the discretion of the director. So I'm not sure if that's what the, del the delegates would want to do. So I don't... I don't support that because I think that's moving away from pushing the players to, to castle with the king first. It's actually making it more lenient. But it's, cer it's certainly replacing 10i2 instead of 10i1 is certainly an improvement. Luis? As someone who runs over 50 tournaments a year without the variation, I prefer the original amendment than just the original motion over the amended motion. Okay, in the front. Um, Charles Unruh, Oklahoma. Speak to the oh. mic. Stop making it so short. Um, <laughs> all right. I think it's a good idea to go with the amendment here because this allows discretionary to those who do work in scholastics and are working with beginning players. This is, to me, this is kind of minor minutia. And really, to little kids, you tell them they have to move the rook, suddenly we probably go more into the retention aspect to where we start increasing 
I should say decreasing the amount of retention. So maybe we go 39% or so, because we tell a kid that he has to castle, or not castle, by moving the rook, or whatnot. Um, I'm sensitive to, uh, in our enrichment programs, we're not feeling punitive when we're teaching kids and encouraging them to play chess. Um, we teach them that you have to touch the king first. And what I think happens is if these kids continue playing, if we, if we teach them the proper way to do it again, uh, according to the rules from the beginning, they learn it quick, they learn it fast, but then they're prepared for when they go on later on to play, they know the rules rather than having the ambiguity of having to switch later on when it comes up. Steve. Well, I think that's exactly an argument in favor of the variation because it allows him, if he wants to teach them with the penalty, to do so. Is it Tim or Ken? Who's talking in the back? Anyone? John Miller from Ohio. OK, um, John. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Point of privilege. Someone earlier said that this would not require somebody to move a rook um, if they touched it. But we are chess players. Touch move means that if you touch it, you have to move it. Um, I guess the point I want to make is, at first I was thinking we were going to make an exception and scholastic players wouldn't have to play the same chess that adults play in tournaments. Then I read this and I realized this really is for adults and for kids. And the amendment makes more sense to me now than it did when I first read both amendments. And knowing that the history of castling was that it allowed the king to move as a knight because original chess players thought that the king should have that privilege. Coming back to what castling is to us means that regardless of which one we pass, we're not going to change chess so fundamentally that this rule is going to change chess for us. We're deciding our preference here. My preference is for the amendment because that discretion allows me to make mistakes that don't take away my intent to castle. And if just, just to be clear, you're at the against Mike, which you're speaking for? Let me ask him five. He said something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he said something about personal privilege. This is not a point of personal privilege. He's out of order. Um, my, my point of privilege was to the argument that... It's my, been raised. My point of privilege was to the argument that someone said that this violated touch move or took away touch move for the rule. That's not a point of personal privilege. Well, I'm holding the rules here, so uh, you can help me out with the parliamentarian. <laughs> personal privilege refers, for example, to if something's going on that you can't hear the discussion okay. or the font is too small that you can't read it. So, so this basically would just be this is just an argu this argument. Is just I'm just basically making my argument. You guys have heard my argument. Um, point of information would be if I was asking a question. I'm, I'm not asking a question. You guys have heard my argument. Um, I definitely prefer the amendment, and I, I've explained why. Again. I, I just like to clarify something. I've been talking to Tim. I've been listening to the discussion. I think it's still unclear what Tim's amendment actually does as written. And I'd like to ask Tim if it's that really his intent, and if it is intent, his intent to make it clear to the body. As written, this motion changes the main rule. It removes the rule that says if you touch the rook first, you move the rook. What we started out discussing was the variation, which specifies what you want to do if you want to allow the player to touch the rook first. And so my question to Tim is, do you intend to remove the main rule, or are we just talking about the variation? Tim. I don't know what my intent was. My intent is not to deal with the forcing of two-minute penalty, which is just going to drive us all nuts because a few people might end up at a tournament where they could be penalized otherwise. Just, it's a silly head. i tell you what, I'm going to withdraw my replacement motion. I'm going to suggest another one that's easier to understand. Oh yeah, this will be a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, Ken just doesn't like this. Okay, people who are making the motion. See up there where it says two minutes added to the opponent's clock? How about two minutes added to the opponent's clock or a warning? That's what you have. 
That's what you have. That's what it says. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just asking him to try to clear things up. If it's not clear, I, I, I'll just withdraw it so the body doesn't have to go nuts, and we'll just go through this again next year. Point of information to the address to the rule book editor. Point of information address to the rule book editor. Are not most penalties specified in the rule book at the discretion of the tournament director as to how I apply the rule and the penalty? Yes. Illegal move, no. So therefore, as a standard penalty, you add two minutes to the opponent's time. Or I can choose as a tournament director not to add two minutes to the opponent's time, correct? If you're applying the standard penalty, but this, this one eliminates that wording, this particular motion that they're presenting. Jeff. Jeff Wheel, Illinois. It's currently set so that the he, organizers that do want to make a king move castling can still use 10i1, 10i2 works well. This is a good move to get people towards doing king castling. Adding two minutes early in the game will not change any games. If there is no clock, it's either no penalty or warning or you go get a clock and apply the penalty. I've done that on occasion, I wouldn't for this. I think this actually works well. Back of the room. In the words of the surprisingly verbose Tim Jess we just heard, I call the question. The question has been called. Point of Is order, the, mo the, the amendment has been withdrawn. Right. That's right. Point of information, I'm Mr. President. I'm speaking to the original motion. I just want okay. to know what we're talking about. Yeah. Point of information, Mr. President, which, what uh, exactly is the motion on the floor that we are discussing? <laughs> <laughs> the amendment has been withdrawn, the original motion as That is correct. It's the original Thank motion you. that is on the floor. All right. I object to calling the question. <laughs> okay, so now we will vote on the objection to calling the question. All those in favor? of the objection to calling the question. No, no. in favor of calling the question. Okay, all those in favor of calling the question. Raise your credentials. All those opposed to calling the question. The question is called. Now we're back to discussion of the original motion. Okay, we're gonna vote, good. That's good, I'm glad. <laughs> so now we will vote on the original motion. Point of information for this body, this is a rules change and it requires a two-thirds vote. You need to count, yes. Okay, delegates in favor of the motion, raise your credentials. Those opposed to the motion. We had 42, we would rather we had 32 for and 42 against. So the motion fails. 
Yeah, needed two thirds to pass. Yeah. Failed. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Tim, membership meeting. I don't know for it. Yeah. Hillary, we confuse you some more. Um, resolve that the members recommend to the delegates that the delegates approve the next edition of the rule book be published online before 1119. The hard copy is to be published ASAP. Frank Guadalupe, let's applaud him, but you're going to after this. He got a hold of the publisher, Random House, or whatever they call themselves now, Penguin Books, and they're not interested in the rights to publish the seventh edition. We can put it online, folks, but you all got to approve the fact that it's going to be done sight unseen and trust that I don't screw it up. Now, you trusted me, <laughs> you trusted me for the sixth edition. This will be the seventh. Um, the format and a lot of stuff is being discussed. Well, you should be able to, if I do it right or have the technology to do it right, download various sections. If all you want are the rules and not the rest of the book, you should be able to do that. You want the whole book? You should be able to do that too. We're working on it. You just got to trust that it's, something's going to be up there you can use. I also predict that whatever it is will probably change format once or twice when all of you put your eyes on it and say, hey, what's that? Well, we'll fix it. It's online. We can do that instantly. So that's all I'm asking you to do. Say we can put it online. You get to approve it, sight unseen. And it's got to be up by no later than the first of next year. OK, as a point of information, I would ask our executive director, Carol, is that what, what Tim said, consistent with the understanding we have from the publisher? In what we received from Random House, we, they have no um, claim to future um, full releases of the, um, the, the rules of chess that, that was published. So if we were to go to version six point something, they would still have rights to that edition, but if we move to seven or beyond, they are not claiming any rights to, to those, those future editions. And if we get it up at 7.0, for instance, and we pass some motions at next year's meeting, we can put 7.1 up. We don't have to sit around and look for that long amendment document that I got to do every year and <laughs> have to be humble about because I always trip on myself. Any discussion? Sure, second. second. Yeah, any discussion? For point of, I guess, information, the rule book that Tim is talking about would be what's otherwise known as the seventh edition. It includes changes made, all changes made by the delegates since the sixth edition. And if there are any changes made at this meeting, it would include them with the proviso that it states they are effective January 1st. That's, the, that's what you were talking about. Yep. So what's the question? He no, that's, I just, <laughs> in answer, I said it was a point of information. And that means you're that's asking the question. question. Yeah, yeah, people are not using point am of information I, correctly. <laughs> point of am information I correct in that understanding, Mr. You're Reader. correct in yeah, the understanding. Okay. <laughs> that's a question. Call the question. Thank you. The question has been called. Are there any objections to calling the question? No. You're just approving the rule. The, the reason, as, as Tim mentioned in the workshop, the reason this is coming up is that the delegates are to approve adi new additions to the rule book. Another point of information. Uh, you mentioned that we would do a hardcover. I mean, my concern would be the lack of promotion of having the book on the bookshelves in the, in the store. I mean, that's a factor as well, right? My question was, are we, doing, uh, are we going to do a, a hardback or, a, or any kind of a book as well? Carol? 
Yeah, discussions have not evolved any further than just some interest in self-publishing. That's it. So yes, there's one plan that would take some different secretarial work on my part to hand over to uh, whoever I have to hand it over to to get it self-published by the Federation. And it would be similar to what the sixth edition looks like. It'd just be one of those packed full of all good kinds of information. The, the, you know, the publishing world has changed significantly. The ability to self-publish and print very small runs is, is there. And I think Carol brought that to us as, a, as an alternative to dealing with Random House and getting a little better control over what we're doing. So that's, that's, that is the thought that we're headed down. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that several of us believe very firmly we really need to have a printed rule book as well. Al, um, from my personal perspective of what I have sitting at home on my computer, we could probably ship it off to self-publishers quicker than I can get it online. But distribution is the fact. <coughs> so, so, the question's been called. Okay, the question's, the question's been, been called. called. The question was called and there were no objections. So now it's time to vote on the motion. Those in favor of the motion, raise your credentials. Those opposed, raise your credentials. It passes. Thank you. All right, at the awards luncheon, we just recognized the contributions of Gary Walters by giving him the Distinguished Service Award. So I think it's very appropriate, and I have co-sponsors Mike Neatman, Mike Hoffpar, Alan Priest, and Robert Messenger resolve that former President Gary Walters be elected a delegate at large. You do not have to be present for the initial election if you're a past president, which is how Gary is qualified. Is there a second to the motion? Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, raise your credentials. Opposed, raise your credentials. Okay. Motion passes. David, 1815. 1815 was discussed by the, the Rules Committee, <laughs> and we came to a consensus in the affirmative, uh, and, and it was discussed in the workshop, and the vote was unanimous in favor. Do, uh, just a brief explanation. This is just, in one case, clarifying, and in one case, adding a rule to the duties of the assistant of a blind or visually impaired player. Uh, we chose not to change the wording, uh, you know, blind or disabled player to what's more currently acceptable because it's, this is consistent with what's currently in the rule book and those kinds of changes um, are for another time or editorial. What this does is it allows the, the uh, player, you know, as different from FIDE rules, FIDE rules say that the assistant can claim time forfeit or, or can claim touch move. Uh, the the uh, USCF rules, uh, a player has to claim touch move. So all we're saying is in order to give the blind player that ability, you have to tell them that a piece was touched without being moved, which, which is allowing for a little bit of time lag. Um, under FIDE rules, it's perfectly acceptable for the assistant to claim the time forfeit, uh, or the touch move, because the arbiter would claim it in FIDE. Uh, but in USCF rules, we want to give the blind player the option of claiming touch move, but we don't want to force him to claim it if he thinks that, that the, the, the move that the player actually made was, was worse than the one that he would have to make if we enforced touch move. Uh, that's an option that we as USCF players have we don't want to take it away from a visually impaired player. Um, and then the other thing that is not explicitly in our rule and is obviously makes sense is that if at any time the disabled player wants a tournament director to make a ruling, the he can tell the assistant, stop the clock, get a director. So uh, we thought this was a pretty straightforward uh, change. And the rules committee and the, uh, uh, and we did run it by the 
uh, Accessibility and Special Needs Committee. Um, since I share a domicile with the chair of that committee, it was easy. <laughs> um, and so this is, this is our recommendation. And as I said, it doesn't change where it keeps the wording consistent with the rest of uh, 35F. Discussion? Is the doghouse now part of the domicile? Out of order. Um, I just have a question. Um, is this going to apply only to blind people or any disabled person? Uh, it would apply as the rules are written. Uh, they state that other uh, disabilities should be handled analogously. 35F10 begins with a blind or disabled player. Right. So presume it's any player that would need an assistant. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, call vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your credentials. All those opposed? It vastly exceeds two thirds. Motion passes. Uh, 1816. All right, again, I have co sponsorship of Robert Messenger, and this is really to bring a delegate action of continuing interest up to date. If you look in the current list of the DACIs on page 11, you see that committee reports are not published in the annual report. Well, there are no committee reports in the annual report. And there's also something about giving them a certain amount of minutes at the delegates meeting. We don't do that. So this is meant to conform to our practice. Now, at the workshop, we made a slight wording change. We're going to eliminate the words as handouts. And I think that was uh, President Hofpour's suggestion. So simply it should say all annual committee reports not published in the delegates call will be distributed at the delegates meeting. And that was in four, it adopted 20 to nothing at the workshop and the committee also had been in favor of it 12 to one. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the vote. All those in favor, raise your credentials. Opposed, raise your credentials. Passes. Well, this is the place for a point of personal privilege. Carol, can we check with the audio people? We've got some feedback and whistling that I know is disturbing some folks because I can see it on their faces. I was wondering if it was just my tonight. No, it's not, it's, it's not your, it's nobody's hearing aid. There's some echo going on. Go ahead. I mean, Go ahead, David. I, I don't know if you wish to speak, to have me speak to this, or you want the executive board to do it first and then have me talk about it, what came out of the committee. Would, uh, I just seek guidance from the chair there. This is an executive board motion, but it uh, is amending the code of ethics. So I'm here as the chair of the ethics committee. The executive board's going to talk to it. Got distracted with the buzzing. Uh, the, we've had a couple of cases in the last year where in the performance of their regular duties, our national events director and then even our executive director filing, an, uh, or someone else in the office rather, filing an ethics complaint. Our current code of ethics requires the filing of a filing fee. In the case of our events coordinator, he ended up writing a personal check. In the case of the other team member, our exec director ended up writing a personal check. It just seemed to us as an executive board when we have team members in the performance of their official duties who have a need to file a complaint that the fee should not be required of them. For anyone who's concerned about an employee going rogue on us, that's why we have a personnel uh, you know, review process. If, if somebody goes nuts, then I'm sure our executive director is going to solve that problem. And it, the question did come up, it would not apply to a team member who would be filing a complaint 
that was not directly related to their official duties. So if you had a person in the office working and they were out directing a tournament that they were just doing as they were tournament director and they wanted to file a complaint based on something that happened at that tournament or in a tournament they were playing in, then it would not apply to that. They would have to file the fee because it was not in accordance with their official duties. Go ahead, David. And the only thing I wanted to say here is that the Ethics Committee was unanimous in its support of this motion, and this also came up at the Ethics Committee workshop, and we were unanimous in the support of that motion, and that vote was 27 to nothing. A point of information, Alan, either for you or David. My question is, would the fact that a employee in the exercising of his or her duties finds that it is necessary to file a claim, would, there create, would it create a perception by not having to file the $50 fee that the office employee um, has the right to, you know, file frivolous complaints or file more complaints or it, it does it cause a problem, the fact that the, the members have to file a fee but yet the office employee doesn't? I can't particularly speak to what someone's perception might be, but if we have a problem with uh, our national events director, for example, filing a whole series of frivolous complaints, I have confidence that our personnel uh, process will resolve that problem right promptly. <laughs> I agree. There is another way to solve that potential concern because entities can now uh, either be the subject or the complainant in an ethics complaint. If it's as a result of their official duties, uh, they could file it as U.S. Chess versus U.S. Chess versus whoever, and then that that. It makes that, even less sense for us to write a check. Oh, correct. We're still. I mean, and to the. Uh, the, the, the filing fee right now is $50, and that can be uh, waived by the ethics committee, by the committee in question. It could be ethics, could be rules, could be TDCC. So if somebody says, I need to file this complaint, but I can't afford the $50, the committee can waive the fee and, in fact, has done so in the past. So I, I, I don't think there's too much of a concern in that regard. I'm Jim Mead from Northern California. I have a, a, a question to ask. It, and what happens if an executive board member goes nuts? <laughs> Sorry. It's happened. Out of order. <laughs> Mr. Pre Alex, Alex, go ahead. Mr. Mr. Pre Mr. Can, let me address that issue. Executive board members are not employees. So this wouldn't pertain to executive board members filing complaints. Mr. President, is, uh, does this body have the authority to extend this to executive board appointed committees? We're only saying that they can file ethics complaints. We're not saying that they can file complaints to TDCC or rules or any of the Board appointed sanctioning committees. The the only area of disciplinary action that the delegates control is ethics. Okay. So fees and stuff related to other things the board can do on its own. Um, we have not done that with regards to the other ones, pending whether the delegates will go along with it here. It wouldn't seem to be appropriate to have one policy in place for one body and another for another. We're hopeful that if the, or the intention is, if the delegates approve it for ethics, it will be extended under the board's authority to set it for the other disciplinary committees by board action. The executive director pointed out that she felt that the word official inserted between related to and U.S. chess would be a good addition here to have the, so to have the word official inserted so that it would read actions related to official U.S. chess activities, which more clearly specifies that it's in the conduct of duties and so forth. Is the board accepting that amendment? Sure. Yes.
I'd like to call the question. Tim? Didn't this gentleman just call the question? Okay. <laughs> he wasn't at a mic, so. He, oh. <laughs> question has been called. Are there any objections to calling the question? Seeing no objections, with the word official inserted into the motion, all those in favor of the motion, raise your credentials. Opposed to the motion. Motion passes. Allen, the next executive board motion. ADM 1818, it's proposed by executive board. Presently, the bylaws state that the executive board will essentially hire directly two individuals, one being the executive director, the other one being a publications director. Um, uh, there were some, as I understand it, some political reasons in the long distant past now, although it may seem like the recent past to some people here, that uh, don't exist today as a practical matter. So, so we're requesting uh, the, the delegates to change the bylaws to provide for the executive director to be able to hire a director of communications and that the treatment of that will be done just like we have with the hiring of a chief financial officer. That will be done with the approval of the executive board. Um, it's kind of weird that we have a whole team that is directly reporting and directly responsible to the executive director, except for one person who reports to us, and all the people who report to the communications director report to the executive director. So it just, it's kind of a weird organizational structure, and we'd just like to bring it back into the way that we're actually running the organization anyway, which is having uh, the communications director report to the executive director. This was discussed by the bylaws committee and in the bylaws workshop. Uh, the committee voted in favor, nine to one, with two abstentions, and the workshop voted 21 yes, uh, zero no, and zero abstentions. So a strong endorsement. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, raise your credentials. Opposed? Raise your credentials. Passes. 1819. This was almost an executive board motion. Six of the executive board members um, voted in favor of it. ADM 1819. Some years ago now, we had a governance task force that had a duty to uh, look at our governance structure. That was done prior to us becoming a 501c3. And our executive director who comes from the 501c3 world has raised some questions about our governance structure and whether certain things that we do make sense for a 501c3. Um, we need to we would like to have the delegates appoint the governance task force and put it back into action just to take a look at things and see if there's some difference in the way we ought to do things. Most 501c3s call for, provide that their boards, you're looking at my behind, it's ugly enough to do, um, call for their boards to be self-perpetuating and many of them have a, a donation requirement to belong to them. That's not our culture. Uh, and that's never going to work in our culture. But how do we institute, how do we bring the ability of maybe significant donors to have some level of participation in helping us do that? Um, I don't know what that looks like. I don't even know if it's possible. So it's time to look at that. There may also be some other provisions within our bylaws that, that uh, need to be adjusted in the, in the world for 501c3. So the, the idea for those of y'all who were around with the prior governance task force of which uh, I had the privilege to be a, a co-chair with Joe Lux on, we, we put a whole series of proposals together, we brought them to y'all, we explained them, and we immediately re-referred it to committee, 
because they, they had some substantive changes. We studied it for a whole nother year. We put stuff on the forums. We had discussions about them. We talked about them in workshops. We changed them around in the whole shoot and match. And then we brought them back the second year. The only thing we're talking about doing, we're talking about following the same playbook. So we're not talking about this coming back with a whole series of wholesale changes for this body to vote on next year. We've talked about coming and making a report. So I think it's probably behooves us to take a look at this and think about how the governance structure might ought to change. Honestly, we might say, don't think it ought to change at all. I don't know the answer to that. The last governance task force had a little more specific charge. We really <coughs> were looking at how we moved the directorship responsibilities from the delegates to the executive board in response to legal issues that had come up with that. This is different than that. This is a lot more fuzzy to an extent, but it's also a lot, um, you know, it's, it's about coming back with a report that what we might do better. So we urge you to support it. Uh, once again, this was considered by both the bylaws committee and the bylaws workshop. The committee uh, voted four to two to zero, and then five to six people saying needs more thought because we didn't have the value of the explanation you just received. Uh, Alan and others though were present at the workshop and gave that explanation, and the workshop voted in favor, 19 yes, zero no, one abstention. Angelina? Angelina Belakovska, Arizona. As, so as you could see, um, my name is the only one that is absent in support of this motion. So that's why I would like to provide explanation. It's not that um, I'm always just enjoying be uh, a single minority, or at least some, some of the time. Um, but I do have the reasoning. So it's not that I'm completely and absolutely opposed to having the task force. I perfectly uh, realize that we are now have the status of 501c3. And the task force doesn't have the enforcement power, it's just a recommendation. Uh, however, as you have heard today and uh, many times before, uh, there is a big, big focus right now on us being 501c3 to the point that we are not legally a membership organization anymore. And yet, you know, like I really feel strongly that regardless of the legal status, we started as a membership organization. We still have hundreds of thousands of members. We have to recognize our roots. And while we are moving forward as a 501c3, uh, there is a danger. Because if you look at 501c3, other 501c3s, they don't have delegates. They don't have elected boards. So they have structures where $50,000, $100,000 get you a seat on the board. If we're going to go down that route. And now, I'm talking about hypothetically and extremes. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, but if, if that's going to happen, we're going to uh, lose who we are. And my concern is that I want to make sure that there is no uh, political pressure. And um, So let me ask a question for you, Angelina. Are you against the motion to have a task force look at it, or, or are you for the motion to have the task force look at it? I'm providing a warning that I want the process to be transparent. I want the process to be not politically influenced. So I want the process to be where we really look for our unique situation where we actually don't influence the task force but look what is important for us and it's what works for us in our situation as a combination of legally 501c3, but also the membership organizations that has 100,000 members, and we don't just mimic what is outside. Thank you. Alan? Well, I think I addressed that. Um, first of all, for those of us who have the benefit of having been involved in governance at the time, which, Angelina, I don't think you were, um, the prior governance task force, I think, was very open in how we did things. We posted a, all kinds of stuff in the forums. It's still there. You can go look at it. We had workshop meetings. We did a whole lot of work, and it was a radical change of what was going on. I think it's a testimony 
to how much work we did and how open we were about it that when we did the vote on the final recommendations after we presented it one year and then brought it back the second year and had modified it based on changes and concerns that people had after consultations with council and all of this stuff that the vote by enrollment which means you showed up walked up and signed a paper was something I don't remember the exact total was something like 118 to 2 so we you know the idea that or the implication that this might be done in secret and some sort of other thing is, is frankly kind of insulting the other issue is that all we're talking about doing well the, another issue is we are a 501c3 because you all told us we were so the fact that we were a 501c4 means very little we are 501c3 with members but you also heard me say I think in our culture the idea that we would completely change how we put executive board members in place and have you write a check to be on the executive board like you are if you're in the Cleveland Orchestra won't work in our culture was I unclear about that it will not work in our culture and I am real certain that this force is not going to come back with that first of all because there's no way in hell y'all to prove it right yeah okay so I think that what we're talking about we need to do and I understand Angelina's concerns I think they're just a little unfounded I have a point of information for Alan of the resolution does not say how the task force will be chosen is it the intent it be chosen by the delegates or by the executive board I call the question not when I, have I don't think we can call the question when we're trying to answer a point of information. That, that came up in the workshop, and the idea was y'all are going to point them. Okay. I mean, it's your task force. So, and we have had some folks, as we discussed it in the workshop, and we've had some folks, as we discussed it, outside the workshop and who have volunteered to participate in that process. Um, I, I, I don't think it hurts to mention who some of those folks are. You want to? I, I mean, you go. I mean, you go ahead and mention who they are. You're the well, you're bylaw. I only know of three people. Yeah, go ahead and mention those three. Myself, Richard Kepke of Northern California, and Robert Messenger of Massachusetts. And uh, Harold and 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 Robert Kepke were on the governance task force before. Um, I would anticipate participating in that process as well because I did it before. Um, I, we're going to elicit the comments and contributions of our executive director because of her expertise in that area and then we're certainly open to having some other folks who may have special expertise in the area would like to participate to be involved with this as well but just like we were talking about with the Connecticut thing if you all approve it the idea is we're going to get you some names together and come back and ask you all to appoint them now I call the question okay the question has been called is there any objection to calling the question Hearing none, vote in favor of the motion. Please raise your hand, raise your credentials. Vote against the motion, please raise your credentials. The motion passes. 1820. 1820 is another almost executive board motion. Uh, six of the seven of us have advanced this. We have uh, a concern that we're churning the rules every single year for one issue which has made getting people on board as to what the rules are it's made it complex and complicated the other concern is that we frequently have a situation where we pass a rule and the next year we're trying and sometimes that's done in haste and sometimes that's done with floor substitutions etc sort of like what we saw earlier today although it didn't pass and then we come back to try to undo the mess. Um, this got down to the rules workshop. They talked about it and they came back with some other proposals that I think address some of these issues. And so I would like to yield the floor to our rules committee chair, David Coons, and let him take it from here. The, the rules workshop moves to substitute for this motion. Uh, let's see. 
All, all rules changed must be approved at two consecutive delegates meetings. No amendments may be made at the second meeting, or if an amendment is made at the second meeting, it's a new motion, so which we'll delay it another year. Okay. The one-year waiting period can be overridden by an 85% vote. Okay, the, the purpose of this is that we get the rule approved, a two-thirds majority of this body. We look at it for a year. Does it work? It's not a rules change yet. We publish it. Okay, so everybody can take a look at it and, and our, and our you know, uh, additional, uh, additional rule changes uh, beyond the seventh edition of the rule book. Okay, so everybody gets a chance to try it out or to look at it or to work on wording or whatever. But uh, the point is, is that, is that then the, it comes up for a second two-thirds majority vote and uh, it should work. Okay, the rules workshop voted, I, I believe it was, oh boy, 19. I don't know. What was it? 19 to... 19-3-0. Okay. Thank you. Okay, in the back. Um, uh, first, I have a question. Would this uh, apply to the rules changes we just made? Okay. It, it does not. Okay. The idea is this would be a... Uh-oh. Get out of here. Do we have a yeah. doctor? Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Can I move the chair? No. Can I move the chair? Can I move the chair? Can I move the chair? Can I He's saying he's okay, so just... Yeah, I think he just may have fell, fallen asleep and fallen off his chair. He's saying he's okay. He's, he's telling us to relax. We have to be more interesting, I think. <laughs> I guess so. This guy's a veteran. You so got water coming. So we got to keep him. There's water coming. Do you have water Thank coming? You. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you got two glasses of water. Okay, let's have some of the persons that aren't involved please take your seats. Okay, we were discussing 1820. The, the, the question had been raised as to whether this would apply to what we're doing here, and the answer is no, it would not. It would apply after. Okay, okay. So even, even the rules changes like 1822 would, would not be. Okay. Yes. Okay, my real point is this does not address the actual point of the original motion, which is to avoid changing the rule book everywhere. This, this adds a delay for a specific rule change, but it still allows us to change the rules every year. There, you're correct. There are actually, there were two rationales for this. One was we're changing the rules and communication is difficult. The other is we change it and we got to go fix it. This only addresses the second part, which is which point everyone in the rules workshop acknowledged. 
One thing that solves a little bit of the other problem is moving the rule book online. And if we have the ability to update that dude and put a new one out there and change the publishing of it very easily, it does resolve some of the other issue. Because one of the problems right now is you've got a printed rule book and then you've got to carry around 14 pages of change sheets. And, and that makes it just doggone difficult. So um, not everybody who was a maker of this motion was at that workshop, but I, on your behalf, I sort of thought it got addressed. When, uh, particularly once we got to talking about the changes in the printing of the rule. So y'all think we're there? Okay. So I think the people who are making the motion think that we've, we've sort of solved the, the other problem with the other situation. Are, are you all accepting it as, a, uh, as an amendment? Which one? Accepting, accepting the amendment or the substitution? The committee has made the substitution. So uh, from my we perfection, proposed has proposed the substitution. So it is my sense from you all that it's okay to accept the substitution. Are we all right? Okay. Yes, we're accepting that as a substitute. Mr. President, may I have a uh, point of information from the rules chair? Yes. Um, it was stated that possibly there could be wordsmithing at the second meeting after we've had a year to think about it, but it clearly says no amendments may be made, is, which is correct. Our, our feeling was that uh, a word change or a, an editorial change that is so insignificant as to not affect it would gather an 85% approval. If more than 15% of the delegates' presence say this change is too big, then it, then, then it is. Bob Messenger. Um, we already have a two-thirds vote requirement so that um, changes that don't have substantial uh, support are going to be voted down. We also very often, the delegates will refer a rules change to the Rules Committee to give it more chance, if the delegates feel that more thought needs to be given. So I think we all, our current procedures already cover, uh, give us a lot of protection from radical rules changes. and. The fact that no amendments can be made at the second meeting takes away the possibility of an improvement to the rule because then you have to go consider it for yet another year. So if this passes, I think we just, obviously we have to be careful to make get it right the first time and not make a change that re require an amendment. But I think I would vote no because I believe our current procedures are adequate. Yeah, so, but one of the effects of this will slow down the rate that rules change because of the facts that if you had two-thirds but you didn't think it was good enough the second time and you don't get two-thirds the second time, it, it won't change. And we won't get, frivolous changes will peter out. And so we, it in general would make it harder to change the rules so we won't get 10 rules changes a year. Steve. Well, for the record, I think this is an excellent motion even though even though Ken Sloan sponsored it, it's still a great motion. Um, but, <coughs> but I am concerned about, about the 85% the as Bob said. Um, I think that might be a little too high threshold to, to change something that needs to be changed. Uh, and sometimes it's not always easy to get the 85%. And even though I don't think that justifies or that should define uh, a rule needing in change, whether a, a rule needing to be changed is defined as one that can garner 85 percent or more support. I disagree with that definition. I think it's a little too high, and I think it, the threshold should be lowered a bit so that it's still not easy to achieve, but not as insurmountable or as as less likely to be surmounted as 85 percent. I apologize, Ken. I would propose 80 percent. See, but it's, it's just to be clear, it's, it's making changes to the change. It's not the final vote on the overall. No, I understand. In other words, if, if I, as I understand it, the 85% rule is invoked if the, the effective date needs to be made sooner than a year. And I think that, uh, or two years, I should say. Uh, so um, I think that's possibly a too high a threshold. 
Um, so uh, I would propose 80% as a substitute. My apologies once again to Ken Sloan. Second. Six, seven, eight, eight. Yeah, it's been seconded to propose 80% to substitute 85% in the motion as listed. Discussion on the 80% of the amendment. 85% Jeff, Jeff, well, well, no, seems right. Looking at the uh, rules changes just at this meeting, it looks like the ones that we're seeing will either be 85% and there will be no additional year waiting period, or they won't pass at all. I don't want to see another 15A bouncing back and forth about writing down the move first. That's something that two, two years in a row would have worked out better. So are you speaking for 80% now? Uh, he spoke against it. That's correct. I'm, I'm not speaking until that's oh, okay. so. Is there any further discussion on 80% amendment as opposed to 85% as originally stated? Call the vote, and the vote will be to favor substituting 80% instead of 85%. All, fa all who favor substituting 80% to replace 85, raise your credentials. Opposed to replacing. Opposed clearly wins. 85 remains the percentage. Now, so now we're discussing the original motion. And I'm speaking for it. Um, I, I think that uh, the point that was made about uh, generally a rules change either passes unanimously or doesn't make two thirds, or nearly unanimously, I should say. And uh, again, the kind of thing we envisioned for needing the 85% also, in addition to editorial type changes, uh, something like uh, a, a change of rule that's necessary to allow us to run a FIDE rated tournament. If, if, if uh, FIDE comes up with a change that just isn't allowable in one of our variations, we would want to add that as a variation rather quickly um, and uh, things like that and it would require it being a variation in order to get 85 percent so that that was our thinking and and uh, again we thought that uh, slowing the process down like this plus the online publication uh, the combination of the two addresses the point that the board was making and addresses it better so just as a point of information, does the, in the interlude between the first and the second year, does that mean that the matter is automatically in the Rules Committee for further consideration, or is it just what's happening? It, it's published, and there can be comments. No, and not published. It, it, it's, the fact that it was passed is published. Yeah, it's published not published as, as a rule. It'll be published as part of the minutes to me. Right, and possibly, Possibly as uh, an addendum to the rule book, there would be an appendix pending rules changes. Ooh. That would, because uh, the, the whole idea of this is to have, uh, is, is to get comments, but again, if we can't get two thirds twice in a row, then we probably shouldn't have gotten it the first time. Bob? Um, just in reference to what Al said, I would, I would I think it's definitely a good idea in the rule book changes to have an appendix to talk about pending rules so that, so that the delegates become aware, especially the um, delegates who are tournament directors, would be aware of what's coming, coming up at the meeting. Because if it's just the minutes, the minutes are something you don't generally see until the, the start of the meeting, whereas the rule book changes is there the whole year. So I would, I would think that's a very good idea. Ernest Schlick, Virginia. I have uh, two comments on this. Uh, first, if we go through the procedure on the amendment right now, suppose a rule passes at the previous year and we're coming back and this rule says no amendments may be made at the second meeting. So if we have a majority, of strong super majority of people who feel, hey, we really need to change this, we would actually have to fail this one make another amendment to have another rule. So what I would recommend is that it be, language be changed, 
that also the uh, no amendment could be changed by an 85% or the, which I guess that's what we were working on now, 85%? Yes, we used yeah, 85 Yes, so amendment could be pros by 85% vote of the, no. It says no amendments may be made at the second meeting. The one year waiting period can be overridden. So the one year waiting period applies to the first year you proposed the rule. The no amendments applied to the second rule. Right. So it requires slightly cumbersome. We decide that we don't like the rule, uh, or there's a change we want to make, an amendment that we feel is important. What we'd have to do is fail it on the second year and then make an, another um, ADM, changing the rule to what we want with the amendment, and then pass it by 85%. It seems to me technically it would just be easier to make an amendment based on an 85% permission. Uh, that, that was what, what Ernie's talking about is the intent, and I don't think a change in wording is necessary to meet that intent. Um, if, if, in fact, the rule is passed that says, um, you know, castling must be done left handed, and we meant to say must, uh, must be done left handed only if, if that's the only way to do it, or some minor thing. Um, somebody that we would put onto the agenda a motion that says the correct thing that would pass by 85 percent and the chair would just rule the old one moot and we wouldn't vote on it it's not a it's not a complicated uh, uh, it doesn't have to be a complicated process so I think uh, leaving it the way it is uh, I think is more clear-cut and it still allows us to do what Ernie wants uh, I, I was just going to say what Al just said, that what, what Ernie was describing is, in fact, the intent of this language. It may be slightly imprecise, but I don't see any easy way to fix it uh, right now. I, I think it says what we mean. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a big deal. The, po the point is, if someone does want to amend it the second time, it's essentially treated as a new motion. Yes. And whether we actually go to the trouble of doing a replacement or voting down the first one and then instituting another one is... Um, a minor detail. Uh, yes, Chris Kim from Maryland. The only uh, point, this is a point of information question. If you pass um, a rule in year one, but and it's supposed to be designed to be feed to get feedback for the second vote, but it doesn't go into effect. How is it that any feedback is going to come back on this rule for the second vote? Because it won't go into effect until two years after you vote for this. So that's the one thing about this rule, which I have a question, is you're not going to get any feedback on it, whether this is good or bad, because the rule won't go into effect for two years. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anticipating uh, Tim getting things online and following along his numbering scheme of saying 7.0 and then following 7.1, I suggest that we may very well have a 7.1 beta. And there may be some tournament directors who uh, choose to use that as a, as a variation and actually try it out in, in play. Which I would submit would need to be a pre-announced. Uh, depending, so depending on the type of rule change, it probably would have to be pre-announced, yes. Which is permissible now. Yes. What would happen if we voted on a rule that we wanted to be changed this year? This rule requires that we can't have it changed. Now, if we pass about 100% here, according to this rule, it still has to wait till next year. No, sorry, that's, that's not the intent of the language. So, the intent is that if you pass it by 85... No, I don't mean today, I mean next year. If we pass the rule next year. Or does that just mean every rule that we vote 100% on next year automatically goes into effect immediately or does it have to have a second vote the next year I, I can answer that number one the very clearly the last one says the waiting period can be overridden so that would mean that even if we pass a, a, a rule change by a hundred percent vote if part of the motion does not say it becomes effective January 1st of this year then it then it's then it's the same as though it passed by June so, 3rd so we just make part of our rule change that it has to take effect this year for every rule change we do and then it just makes this we, kind of sense. We could do that and we would be derelict in our duty were we to do that. Okay, 
is, yes, we can certainly do that. We can also, by a simple majority, throw that rule out any time we want. Uh, we'd have the, to wait a year and get 85%. The, 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 the point being that when we pass a rule, we're saying we think this should be a rule. The default action is it doesn't come into effect unless we pass it again next year, having come to our senses. If we think the rule needs to go into effect immediately, we make that part of the motion. Or a second motion. Or a second motion. Second motion. Or a second motion. Better, a second motion. So we pass a rule by 100%, and it goes in and, and, it's in, and it becomes a waiting rule. Then somebody makes a motion that says, I move that the motion just passed become effective immediately, or effective January 1st this year, and that motion requires 85%. So I, I don't think it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't hobble us. It's sort of, it's sort of like, like uh, uh, you know, putting a combination lock on your refrigerator. It doesn't stop you from snacking, but it makes you think about it before you do it. Yeah. Can I say something? Uh, I can certainly imagine situations where you would get a 100% vote to change a rule, but not get 85% to implement it immediately. Because there may well be people who are in favor of the rule but would prefer to wait a year and make sure we've got it right. So, uh, so, so that means I think there really should be two motions, one to pass, the, pass the, the rule change, and if desired, another one to say override the, the waiting period. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, call the vote. All in favor of 1820 as stated, raise your credentials. From the rule as amended by the rules committee. This is the subsequent motion. It's a It's not amended. It's not amended. Oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, it's on the screen. Yeah. All opposed? Motion passes. Mike Heatman will speak to 1821. Over the last couple of years, I've been kind of monitoring um, uh, towards the end of the registration period for our uh, registration to vote in our elections. And it seemed that the office uh, was putting out emails uh, a couple of days prior to the deadline. And I think that's a disservice to our members uh, because a couple of days is just not enough time if you're away for a weekend or something. Um, I would prefer to see that a month in advance. So this uh, particular motion uh, just basically, uh, yeah, it's a bylaws change. Um, I think that's okay. I don't think that's a problem. Some people at one of the uh, bylaws I think workshop had a problem with it, but um, I think I um, had a problem with it being a bylaws change, but be that as it may, I think the concept is that we need to ask the office to send that uh, email out reminding people to vote a little earlier in the month uh, we've got April 1 here, uh, and that's just the meaning of that. Just have the office do it earlier in the month to give us all, uh, all of our members more time uh, to uh, register to vote other than, you know, a couple of days. Now, of course, this month we had a problem with the website being down, so we were actually granted an extra day. But the interesting part is that that was the email sent to people, uh, I believe, two days before uh, uh, the registration deadline saying that it was going to be extended for a day. So that's my idea. All right, this was discussed both by the bylaws committee and the bylaws workshop. Now, the committee was fine with this and voted 12 to 0, 0 in favor. And the workshop agreed with the principal fully and voted 21 to 0 in favor. But the question is, should it be in the bylaws or not? And that caused a lot of heated debate at the bylaws workshop. And the vote on whether it should be a bylaw was nine saying yes, it should, but 10 saying no, it shouldn't. So that was almost an even split. Guy Hoffman, Wisconsin. My general complaint is why do we need to have a bylaws change or a DASI for what is essentially an office procedure? Can't the executive board just tell the office to put it out by April 1st? 
It's just a clarification. It's codified. Um, that's all. Randy. Randy Bauer, Iowa. Um, along the same lines as Guy. I, from my perspective, these are kind of management issues that should be addressed in that way and for us to be putting this kind of stuff in the bylaws which is kind of like the same thing as what I see in a lot of the um, prior delegate actions that really the executive board can deal with can deal with it through the um, through our executive director and we just don't need to clutter up the bylaws with this kind of stuff any other discussion Hearing none, call the vote. Those in favor of the motion, raise your credentials. Do we count? Are we good? Got it right Okay, the no's have it, 41 to 34. Is the motion fails. Could, could we get a straw poll amongst the delegates as to the advisability of just having the office notify people by April 1st? I don't think he was supposed to contact us to get us into that, okay. so that he won't think we're interfering in the election process. Can we do that, Mr. President? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So let's have a straw poll that would allow their office to exercise a duty to Ask notify the by 1st of April. It's an army. Opposed? Okay. We got March more. Yeah, it's good. Eighteen twenty-two was discussed by the Rules Committee and the workshop. Uh, the wording was arrived at uh, by consensus of the Rules Committee and the workshop was unanimously in favor. Discussion. Seeing none. I'm sorry, Bob. Is this? Why do you two The chair, oh, well. Okay, yes, I will say something about why, just very quickly. The intent of this rules change is to eliminate an ambiguity in the rules about when a game is drawn because of either a dead position or a player loses on time but the opponent has insufficient material to checkmate. There's an ambiguity in that the question is when does a move actually take effect? Does the player have to press the clock in order for the move to have taken effect? Or just determine the move? This resolves an ambiguity. There is no discussion. We'll call the vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your credentials. All those opposed? The motion passes. Here's where we are, folks. We got one, what, one, four. two, three, four, four left. But and there's we got some presentations, and if there's anything wait, new, but there Mr. Maybe President, there's also vote. approximately four, maybe five additional ADMs that have been submitted that are not in the delegates and, call. And the ADMs, they are not ADMs. They're new delegate motions, yes. Right. And we also have a couple of approved groups that we need to pocket. Okay, hold on. 
Hey, here's maybe we'll do another one, Alan. Straw holes. We can do this one. I guarantee it'll be quick. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're gonna withdraw it. We see her. We got we got to stop pretty soon for y'all who are playing to get ready to go. Yeah. Uh, it's ten minutes to five. Yeah. Um, I don't think we can get this whole agenda done today if we go to five thirty or something. No. So you know, pretty quickly we're gonna stop. Is that okay, with everybody? Yes. Yep. I yes. guess this is gonna go fairly quickly, as Steve says, and then maybe we'll we'll call it a day after that pick up in the morning. Okay. If more than three people get up to the mic. Yeah, they're, 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 they're at least the three people on the Connecticut committee. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Go ahead. I would like to move that this motion be referred to the executive board in the hopes they might also consult the women's committee. All right. Um, Second. This did come up at the committee in the workshop. The uh, Committee was divided. A lot of them thought it needed more afford it need to be deferred to either council or the executive board, but the workshop voted 22 to 0 to 1 to refer it to the executive board. I second the motion to refer. Just to, as information for the delegates, um, because most of you may be aware of this and some may not, and be mindful of your time. Um, the executive board, with advice and consulting counsel, had adopted a, a transgender policy. Um, shortly after that, Steve raised some issues with it, and his motion is largely in response to the original policy. We have not changed the policy, but our, our exec director did issue some clarification of those issues, which are some frequently asked questions. And we'll have, I know we have that available for you all to see, but I don't, if you want to see it, hang around and she'll present that and allow you to see it because I think we have it both on screen and in a handout. So if you'd like to get that and take a look and see what both the policy are and the handout, um, where are they, Carol? It's on a double-sided one sheet. Was it down here in front of us? Yeah. Oh, so you may have already picked it up. Take a look at that if you've got questions about it. Um, you know, see Carol. <laughs> yeah. Motion. No, not motion. Just say you're going to be recessed until nine tomorrow morning. Okay. No, we, yeah. we are discussing. Any further discussion? Steve? We are discussing. Are we on 1823 then? No, yes. We're on 1823. Okay. It seems. To be the second, oh, it, the motion is oh, to refer in that one. Okay, all right. That's correct. Is there any discussion on the motion to refer? Yeah, I guess I have some discussion on the motion to refer. The, the original motion came out of an EB motion, the, the motion that prompted Steve's ADM. So if we're referring it back to the makers of the original motion, it, you, I, I, that was going to be one of my questions. You, you said consult who? The women's committee? Yes. Okay. Is that the part of the uh, Well, if it's referred, I guess you're referring. I'm, no, it's uh, it's, now refer, it's, it's referred to us. It's referred to you and, and you're, you're... He's like, asking that we have the women's that committee that you, look at it. You ask the women's committee to look at it and that satisfies your objection if they relook it and consult the women's committee. Okay. Yeah. And it should also be noted that Carol has told me that uh, this will be referred to legal counsel as well for their opinion. You have a question. Isn't this moved to the second part? At least it says if an individual attempts a second change in gender identification, they must provide a birth certificate. Well, if they're changing back to what they originally were, would that be on their birth certificate? That, that's, that's, a, that's out of order. That's because we're not talking about that. We're talking about a motion to refer. Uh, Maureen Grimaud, South Carolina, Chair of the Women's Committee. I agree that uh, it should be referred in discussion with the EB and, um, and out of the Women's Committee. Any recommendations? It, we should also note this is not simply a women's issue. Exactly. Right, right, right. And that's my point. Danny? It should also be referred to the Accessibility Committee as well. Doesn't matter, we'll figure it out. 
We'll figure, we'll figure it out. Okay, we call the vote on referral. All those in favor of referral, raise your credentials. Opposed? This body is in recess. The motion passes to refer. This body is in recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. local time.